There once was a time when Marxism marched across the planet. When millions of workers were active members of Marxist political parties. And in militant trade unions, they fought for their rights to suffrage, an eight-hour workday, and a fair wage. There once was a time when literature like Edward Bellamy's best-selling novel Looking Backward depicted popular hopes for a future free of profit, where men and women were masters of their own destinies, living in abundance and harmony. There once was a time when even the American left had its own living, breathing, city-building heroes. Eugene V. Debs, who led the fight to expand the power of radical trade unions and won over a million votes running for president under the socialist ticket, after being imprisoned for opposing Washington's involvement in the First World War. Upton Sinclair, who wrote about the horrific excesses of America's meatpacking industry and its utter disregard for workers' rights. Morris Hillquit, who documented the history of America's socialist movement in his book History of Socialism in the United States, so that even now people can get a glimpse into what the struggle was like in the late 19th, early 20th century. But despite all of the socialist movement's successes, there was one big problem, the proletarian revolution that was supposed to overthrow the capitalist class and establish a world dictatorship of the proletariat never took place. Indeed, Marxism's influence had spread across the industrialized world. The works of Marx and Engels on political economy had spread to nearly every intellectual circle. And in the late 19th century, after decades of reeling economic depression, Marxists from the times of the Second International were sure capitalism was about to meet its demise. But then, the system changed. A coup d'etat within the capitalist class was taking place. Replacing the industrial robber barons at the system's helm came the financiers. Speculation and legal loan sharking were bringing more and more of the world economy under the control of a small minority of capitalists from the world's industrialized countries. They exported their excess capital abroad for the purpose of plundering the underdeveloped world's resources and dividing amongst themselves the spoils. New management saved the system from impending doom. But like everything else in capitalism, it came at a price. Free competition had been sacrificed at the altar of profit, and in its place came the age of monopoly capitalism. In its place came imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. The dawn of imperialism spelt trouble for working people everywhere. It was the next logical step in capitalism's socio-economic development. With the underdeveloped world's resources now at its fingertips, the capitalist class could continue to feed its insatiable desire for profit and concentrate unprecedented wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people. As wealth concentration led to the formation of monopolies, the capitalist state ceased to exist only to protect the existing property relations. It became, like anything else, a commodity to be bought and sold at the whim of the top crust of the bourgeois class. The most powerful monopolists became the true electors of the country's politicians, as candidates who dared to defy their rule never stood a chance to win vital campaign donations during the money primaries, no matter how many people suffrage was extended to. The monopolists used their newfound domination of the state to intensify suppression of working class organizations throughout the industrialized world, to send imperialist militaries on rape and pillage expeditions in underdeveloped countries, and to keep as many other nations as weak and impoverished as possible. One of the foremost consequences to the monopolist rise to power was an ideological crisis, the crisis of Marxism. Capitalism wasn't supposed to recover from the economic chaos it created in the late 19th century. Marx described capital overaccumulation as one of the system's prime contradictions. It produces an eternal cycle of economic booms and busts, but the economic bust between 1873 and 1896 was so damaging and all-encompassing 
it seemed the system was falling apart at the seams. Most Marxists thought the system would collapse under its own weight. Instead, imperialism emerged and was made possible by a massive expansion in the export of capital, thus hyperextending the capitalist system's lifespan and temporarily rectifying the dangerous affliction of capital overaccumulation. Marxists everywhere were thrown into nihilism and ideological confusion. This flies right in the face of Marxist theories. Perhaps the dictatorship of the proletariat really is impossible. The main saboteur of Marxist theory from that period was a member of the German Social Democratic Party named Edward Bernstein. He claimed Marxism needed revision to make it relevant and adapt it to capitalism's new conditions. But for Bernstein, revisionism meant stripping Marxism of everything that made it an ideological weapon in the hands of the proletariat. Revolution? Out the window. Bernstein expected the capitalists to hand over their power through social reform. Scientific socialism? Out the window. Capitalism will just develop into socialism through osmosis. The very core concept of Marxism, historical materialism? Out the window. Revolutionary German socialist Rosa Luxemburg was a member of the Social Democratic Party at the time. She explained that revisionism amounts to the advice that we abandon the social revolution, the goal of social democracy, and turn social reform from a means of the class struggle into its final aim. But Luxembourg's warning went unheeded, and revisionism triumphed as the main ideological current of the German Social Democratic Party, as it did in other social democratic parties across the globe. When the First World War erupted between Europe's major imperialist powers, social democrats supported the call to war, a call for millions of workers to murder one another in the name of their capitalist overlords' desire to conquer the international markets. In abandoning the class struggle, social democrats became class collaborators in the purest sense of the word. They cheered as Luxembourg and her supporters were imprisoned for protesting the war. Years following Germany's defeat, they even deployed a proto-fascist military group called the Freikorps, which ultimately murdered Luxembourg and her comrades. It was a damaging betrayal for radicals everywhere. But in socialism's darkest hour, a hero emerged by the name of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, or as you probably know him by, Lenin. This Russian revolutionary theorist understood that Marxism's core principles needed expansion, not revision. Lenin wrote Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, illustrating this new chapter of social development to the world. He wrote The State and Revolution, expanding upon Marx's critiques of capitalism and helping revolutionaries everywhere understand how to overcome imperialism by achieving the next stage of historical development free of class exploitation, socialism. After all, the Bolsheviks under Lenin's leadership were the ones to establish the world's first ever dictatorship of the proletariat on a national scale. It was thanks to their contributions that the crisis of Marxism had been conquered and that Marxism once again marched across the planet. That was over a hundred years ago. 
Since then, the tides of the class struggle have changed. Through a combination of ideological subversion from the West and the outright surrender of the world communist movement's leaders to liberalism, the USSR was brought to its knees in 1991. It was the superpower that dared to obstruct Western imperialism from sinking its claws into the rest of the world, the defender of anti-colonial struggles around the Third World. As a result, many countries that had emerged out of the chains of colonialism to become industrialized nations through bitter class struggle fell into economic turmoil. In Cuba, it was called the Special Period, when 80% of the country's imports instantly vanished. In the DPRK, it was called the Arduous March, when the loss of Soviet imports combined with the worst natural disasters in decades created a famine that killed hundreds of thousands of Koreans. And in Russia, although it wasn't colonized, the period's still known as the Wild 90s. You can watch my other video to learn more about that. To make matters worse, the fall of the USSR and Eastern Bloc opened the doors for the development of a new, more exploitative stage of imperialism. One in which first world jobs are outsourced in mass to be super exploited in underdeveloped countries, in which despair and drug addiction have replaced the vibrance and liveliness of the West's once thriving industrial cities. Many describe this new system as globalism, birthed from neoliberalism's triumph over late socialism and characterized by the largely unchecked global dominance of Western finance capital. This combination of events has spawned a new crisis of Marxism, comparable in scale to the one from the time of Luxembourg and Bernstein. Many communist parties have fallen into defeatism, contenting themselves with reverting and eternally remaining book clubs. Others have become outright revisionists, supporting bourgeois politicians they think are not so bad, and spending their time supporting liberal social reforms. Identity politics, sex, gender, race, categories into which workers easily become divided, are at the forefront of discussions in many socialist circles, with little to no time given to the material reality that unites us all, class. It should come as no surprise that the events leading up to this defeat have coincided with some of history's greatest victories for profit. Today's revolutionary movement needs working-class heroes, people to fill the shoes of 21st century Lenins and Rosa Luxembourgs, activists and organizers who can offer a diagnosis for the serious illness leftism faces today, and suggest a treatment that will reinvigorate masses of people searching for their historical purpose. Some of us have already contributed to conquering this behemoth task, like John Smith, who attempts to create a theory of modern imperialism in his book Imperialism in the 21st Century, Globalization, Superexploitation, and Capitalism's Final Crisis. Brian Becker, who wrote Imperialism in the 21st Century, updating Lenin's theory a century later. Or David Harvey, who's written numerous works for decades on both capitalism and imperialism. One recent and very important ideological contribution is a book called City Builders and Vandals by my friend and colleague Caleb Maupin. The book directly tries to grapple with the current crisis of Marxism, explaining how the contemporary workers' movement became ideologically compromised. Maupin illustrates how CIA-funded organizations like the Congress for Cultural Freedom supported anti-communist postmodern leftists to divide the movement. How they popularized right-wing fixations like Tibetan Buddhism and Hindu social hierarchy in leftist circles, and encouraged drug use as a viable form of rebellion against capitalism. How their so-called intellectuals like Hannah Arendt and Susan Sontag popularized the phony concept of totalitarianism and the idea that working towards an ideal that transcends individualism is equatable to fascism. CIA money was undoubtedly pivotal in creating what Maupin terms the synthetic left, a tendency he tactfully covers throughout the book along with the Atlanticist pathology, the widespread mentality of violence characteristic of empires like the United States. Our movement needs educated revolutionary theorists now more than ever to refine Marxism-Leninism into the powerful working class weapon it once was. Equally as important are agitators and organizers who can bring working class people into the fold, combining theory with experience. So go out and organize, comrades. Next time you feel like playing video games, pick up a book. Next time you feel like escaping reality, come in conflict with it. Next time you feel pessimistic, remember how tough times were for our predecessors, because the battle is going again, and we have much work to do.
будут новые победы, станут новые бойцы. 